Welcome everyone to the very first INIT 2019, the very first conference of many to come. It is a great honor and pleasure to see you here in this number, to see the payoff of the amazing work of people who organize this conference. You are in for a special treat, for many, for many interesting talks, speakers, and much more. Before we continue, I would like to ask you all to install an application called Slido. It is a very simple application which will be used for asking questions. It's simple to install on your phone. You have the manual on your accreditation. The official hashtag is in it. Just select the whole, ask the question, or vote for one who you like. At the end of every lecture, we will have approximately 10 minutes for Q&A, and I will be asking the questions to the speakers. And now, let's continue. I would like to call Goran Jakovljevic on the stage, the director of this year's conference, to share with us a couple ideas on the future plans. Please welcome. Hello, everyone. In front of the whole group that organized the event, I would like to give you a warm welcome. The group was organized by the team of 14 people, mostly developers. We had 10 developers for uh, two designers, PR girl, architect girl. When you have architect girl and designer in the same group with developers, you also get this horse as a bonus. It, is, it has its own story, which I'll tell you later. Uh, all of them worked really hard, especially the last few days, so huge props to all of our team. Uh, we got uh, huge, huge support from IT companies and also IT community, not only from Banyaluka but from the region as well. Thanks to the support that we received, we managed to keep the price of our tickets affordable for everyone, which was our initial goal since INIT is non-profit. We managed to give away around 50 of our tickets. Back in February, when we first started talking about organizing this event, we were hoping to have around 200 people. And with that, we would call it, it was successful. But currently in this room, there are around 400 people. And not only from Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, but also from Germany, Austria, Netherlands, and I believe uh, Bulgaria. So if you're not from Banja Luka, welcome to Banja Luka. Everybody probably already told you that you should try Banja Lučki Čevapi, because uh, Bogdan Ketsman, when he arrived yesterday, he's one of our speakers, he had uh, Chavapi within one hour arriving in Banja Luka. Um, huge, huge uh, thanks for all of you for coming here today. Huge thanks for, to all of our sponsors, to our friends, without whom in it would not be possible today. Uh, I would like to thank also Atso from coming here from Belgrade to help us out, and also more people that are also organizing a lot of conference in the region. They were a huge help for us. Thank you and have fun. Thank you, Goran. Thank you, Goran. And I also want to give huge thanks to our sponsors who help us organize all of this. Companies Bay 42, Oroundo, Frontier and RCT, as well as King ICT. There are also those who extended their full support, such as BLC Banyaluka College, Jazz Guru, Netologia, IM2 Studio, DVS Solution, MCloud, Infomedia, Blitzneta, Alea, Toptal, and friends Lezibeg, Omnes Consulting, Beat Alliance, Coca-Cola, Kraina Class, Java Coffee and Cafeteria 5, Teleclick and Kuvo, AGF and Istec. We will also take special empathy, empathize the company Elda Lux and Segway, thanks to who some of you will, actually only one of you will go home on electric scooter. Stay tuned for the, about the details during the day. And now, for the very, I would like to go to the reason why we are all here today. I would like to call the first of amazing 17 speakers to join me on the stage. Please welcome Tomislav Bronzin and Arjan Stipic.
The stage is yours. Yeah. Oh, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 115. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Hello, good morning. My name is Tomislav Ronzin, and my colleague Arjan Stipic will today talk about uh, what they were talking, you know. We will talk about uh, artificial intelligence. We talk where is artificial intelligence today and where is tomorrow, which is much, much closer than we thought before. So, but just first two things about us. My colleague, uh, my, uh, my colleague uh, Arjan Stipic uh, is digital transformation advisor for many years now. And he was one of the first Microsoft regional directors in the world for the Croatia and Bosnia Herzegovina at once. Now, I am the Microsoft regional director for the Croatia and global, global program, Microsoft Most Value Professional. Together, we are working on the number of uh, projects, which includes artificial intelligence, for which uh, our teams were awarded with more than 70 international in, uh, awards for innovations around the world, from the US, uh, Asia, you know, and uh, Europe, of course. So today, we will actually give you a landscape about the artificial intelligence implications and spe specifically about the deep learning advancements, which are very recent, but very, very important, especially for the work that we are doing in our industry. So you can see here is our agenda for today. We'll first talk a, a little bit about the history. And you will see that artificial intelligence is not from the yesterday. The problem is that uh, this technology actually faced in the past. We'll talk about, the, of course, the deep learning, which is the top, hot topic now in the area of the artificial intelligence. Some of the implica implications and implementations will talk about, of course, AI today and tomorrow. We'll see that tomorrow is very close, not, not some very fast, uh, some very distant future. And we'll talk about the AI examples which are surrounding us. And, you know, I'm talking not just, you know, around the world, but here in the region as well. Of course, We'll talk about the show the money, you know, how to earn the money, how to make a profit from the technology and impacts on the jobs, ethics, and of course about the robots. So let's start with the history. History of the AI started somewhere in the 50s. And you will see, you know, that this journey was not without, you know, some downhills. And actually we'll see later that Usually technologies has, you know, some kind of the uphill, you know, like some kind of the excitement about the technology and then there is downhill, you know. And you can see here from the, this timeline that actually AI has so-called two winters, two downhills. Not as usually it is with the technology, just, you know, uphill and downhill and then, you know, somehow the technology either goes to the production in general usage or not. But we can see that, you know, in the past, not so distance past, like, like Deep Blue, when Deep Blue actually won the chess uh, game against the that time, you know, uh, worldwide, you know, the most, the best player in the role, Kasparov. Then after that, actually today, human doesn't matter in this game because today, the real games are played between the computers and different AIs. 
Then, of course, a lot of you have in your uh, mobile phone Siri. Siri, and then Cortana, of course, Alexa, and so on. Watson was, you know, something that IBM uh, very boldly came in 2011. Why I'm telling very boldly, you will see later, because they are betting in the area which is very important for the humans, and this is uh, like a medicine and well-being. And, of course, 2017, AlphaGo, and today we are not anymore so much talking about the technology, but we are talking about the ethics and how actually we are thinking that maybe in some areas artificial intelligence will replace humans or not, we will lose jobs or not. So these are very, very important uh, questions. This graph here actually, you know, visibly shows what I was talking about these two winters and why it was like that. Why it's not like with usual technologies, like we have some kind of hype and then, you know, downhill like uh, winter and then we have technology that is in usage. This was because of two things. First, it was the lack of processing power. Actually, there was no sufficient resources that could process enough information in real time to use the technology right. And the second thing is what the lack of the data. We will see on the, this graph how usually the technology, it is with the technology. This is the Gartner, uh, Gartner graph, and you can see that usually the, the different technologies on this graph, they're in the different stage of the maturity. Some kind, somehow, you know, those technologies are somewhere on this curve. And you can see that on the right-hand side that the technology plateau, which is when the technology is actually uh, useful and uh, you, you can say that is a commodity, is just two technologies. And some of these technologies that you could expect that would be much more closer to this plateau of usage is still on the left side of the graph. We'll talk about these technologies, we'll talk how, you know, uh, you can use it today, or what is the advancement that can be used to push these technologies more far right on this graph. So, some of the simple facts about AI. What are the key ingredients that actually help us to achieve the ideal thing that we call artificial intelligence, and what actually intelligent is. So some definition says that the intelligence is when you process information much faster than others. So the key ingredient should be data. You should have some kind of the data, information that you will process. You can find in the you know, different sources that in the last year, humankind generate more data than the humans in whole history of the humans. So it's a huge amount of the data. So today we have enough or we have too much data. So what's the problem now? It's not the problem that we don't have the information, the data, but the problem is that we don't have the time as a humans to process the data. So we need some help and the help would be, of course, some kind of intelligence artificial intelligence to do that. But to process the data, what we need? We need the power. We need the processing power, which is today sufficient enough to do the processing on this huge, huge amount of the data. And the thing is that the, these three ingredients are very, very important to realize the artificial intelligence as we are seeing today. And now, is the moment in the human history, in the technology, in the industry, that we can do this. So, today we are actually talking about the new kind, new approach, not so new, new in the whole human history, but not so new in the industry, about the deep learning. And what's, what is the difference between the machine learning and deep learning? You can see in this you know, picture on the right-hand side, how you know, everything puts 
inside this shell, artificial intelligence, which is embracing all this technology, machine learning, neural networks, deep neural networks, and so on. So machine learning algorithms require so-called structured data. So you have database, you have, you know, uh, strings or arrays of the data numbers, you, which you, you know, transfer some information from the real life to the numbers, and you crunch the numbers. But deep networks learning are actually relying on the layers of the data. Some of the, these layers are actually hidden layers, and these layers are processing, you will see later on, you know, just small, you know, chunk of the processing, no, not the whole picture. And the great thing about the deep learning is that it can actually learn from, you know, from one step to another step, from the examples, from the previous step, uh, make decisions and create the models by themselves. You know, in the history, if you wanted to have great artificial intelligence model, you should train, you know, the system. You should, you know, invest a lot of time, human time, to create models and train the system. Today, deep learning networks actually are learning by themselves. You gave them some set of rules, and then within these rules and actually some marginal, you know, conditions, they are trying to train themselves. And they're learning by, you know, doing the processing. And again, the data is the key. So how it looks like for deep learning network? As I said, there's a different layers of the processing network. And actually, you have input layer, we have decision at the, at the far right side, which is from the output layer, and we have a number of hidden layers. Each hidden layer actually is doing some processing part. If we are actually doing facial expression, which we are doing in our projects, the facial for facial expression recognition, you actually, what do you first do when you have a picture of the full grown human? First, you locate where the face is. So one layer is actually locating the faces of the people on the picture. And then the next layer is doing what? Trying to find where is the eyes, the, the nose, and so on, and so on, and so on. So each layer is doing so subatomal, you know, processing and doing some decision branching, you know, within these layers. So as much data you have, you know, more is better. And as more hidden layers you have, you're doing a better processing. And why it was not, you know, possible before? Because you didn't have enough processing power to do a lot of hidden layers. You should, you know, restrain yourself to some, you know, optimal number of layers that will give you a result in the real time. Today is different. You have a processing power that can you know, process information, make decisions, and number, number of these layers. So we were talking about the data. Performance versus data volume. We said we have enough processing power. And what happened, actually, is that for the so-called conventional, conventional is a little bit, you know, strange, term for the so new technology, but for the traditional ma machine learning, shallow net neural networks and medium neural networks, actually we got to the saturation when giving more data is not producing better results. You know, there is, you give, put more data, the results are the same as it was the end of this curve. But what happened with the deep learning networks? Actually, we didn't get, you know, until today to the saturation point, which will give us no advancement in performance, in processing of artificial intelligence of the data. So the deep neural networks profits from the more data. More data, better results. We have enough power, power to produce, you know, performing system. So this is why deep neural networks are very, very important today. And not, not to speak, you know, just abstractly, this is something which I actually, with the permission, of course, of the, uh, my colleague Dubroko Hlede, 
who is a CIO of uh, Rimac Automobili, which I suppose that you are aware of this company, that uh, they are producing the fastest electrical cars in the world. Actually, they are doing autonomous driving, you know, uh, systems, and they're creating these systems, and uh, they actually purchase one of these units, which is 4.5 petabytes of the storage. You can see that one petabyte is 1,024 terabytes of data, you know. And they're planning to harvest more than 90 terabytes per day of the data, which will lead to the 75 petabytes of the data in some one or two years. But this is small amount of the beta. So today, you know, big, uh, huge companies are harvesting extabytes or zettabytes of data, which is, you know, one unit or units, one class up, 1,024 petabytes or 1,024 times 1,024 times, you know, terabytes. So it's a huge amount of the data that actually is harvested. And this is not somewhere in the US, it's here in the region. Okay, Arian. Okay, so uh, we learned uh, about this trilogy, uh, data processing power and uh, the way we are processing that data. But uh, everybody is trying a different thing. So uh, there is no universal recipe how to process the data the most efficient way. And uh, what is actually happening for the last six years or so is that the way we are processing data using deep neural networks is really changing the history. It's literally so. Uh, traditionally, chess and some other games have been the ultimate test of comparing the level of intelligence of humans compared to, of course, machines. And you already know that in 1997, Deep Blue had won the match, entire match against Garry Kasparov. But, but, the thing is that uh, from that point on to about two years ago, it was actually the demonstration of brute force. So what those machines, beginning with Deep Blue and all the way to Stockfish and, and the others today, are doing is they do have a lot of data, all available uh, games in the history of chess, plus all available principles, end games, opening books, all that stuff. So they are not starting from, from scratch. And then they are trying to calculate as much, to simplify as much move in advance as possible. And uh, they are doing that uh, quite successfully. So uh, 1997 was this, this turning point where the brute force of, of processing, together with the data that, that has been given to them, has surpassed the level of intelligence, the ability to play of a human. But basically, nobody uh, would tell you that those machines were more intelligent than, than us. They were more successful because they were, <laughs> they were uh, operating at much greater speed. And that's all. But two years ago, something very, very different has happened. So uh, how many of you, I suppose most people here, do know about AlphaZero? OK, so AlphaZero is a Google project. Alpha, uh, Google uh, uh, DeepMind uh, is, is one of, of Google teams. Uh, actually, it's a company uh, that developed AlphaZero. AlphaZero is an artificial intelligence uh, program that demonstrated the ability to play very complex games, the most complex games that humans have ever invented. And what did they do? 
they prepared, of course, the program, they gave initially only the rules of chess. So zero data, zero. Only the rules of chess, and they let AlphaZero play with itself. Game after game after game after game. And after eight hours, you will see typically uh, uh, the number four hours, no, it was eight. After eight hours of playing with itself, what happened? Alpha Zero beat the most advanced chess engines today. Those that were at the time based on conventional methodologies, the same methodologies as SD Blue, okay? And that was very, very convincing, but it's not the result that counts. Everybody was impressed with the way those games have been played. Something different had happened. A quantum leap was, was struck because if you look here, this is, uh, uh, this, these are the numbers of, of uh, uh, games, or, or not, not games, positions that uh, human alpha zero and, and uh, uh, conventional programs are looking ahead, okay? So normally the, 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 more, the more positions you are able to see ahead in the same time, the better you play. That's brute force approach. But alpha zero, really is not looking that far. It's looking in a different way. And when you, when you take a look at the games, what happens is that Alpha Zero plays like a human. And it's strikingly obvious. That means that Alpha Zero, in eight hours, developed the understanding of the principles of the game, and it did not only comprehend the principles that we understand after 2,000 years of playing chess, but also, obviously, uh, Alpha Zero understands the game better than everybody else. This is, if you think about it, this is normally called the intuition. So. There is absolutely no doubt about it. Be, be clear about this. Alpha Zero and similar applications do have intuition. So this is something that is normally associated with humans. Okay? So uh, many people were were <coughs> were uh, not convinced because AlphaZero uh, did this training on specialized hardware, on tensor processors. And actually, uh, yeah, this is, the, this is, we are going to go through this very quickly. It's not only about chess. It's the other two most complex games, Go and Shoggy. Uh, so whenever you define well-defined set of rules, which is a game, and feed it to the very same engine, not some other combination. This engine, the same engine that, that, uh, that won this, this uh, chess match against Dogfish, uh, this engine will beat anybody else in the world. It will learn from playing with itself, and it, it will beat anybody in the world with any kind of, of uh, well-structured game and it takes a matter of hours to do that from zero. So this is, this is really scary. It's a direct consequence not of a brute force, not of the data, obviously, because there is no data. It's the, the consequence of intelligence. Okay. Uh, so uh, they said, okay, but what, what about uh, real, life, uh, real life hardware? How would that uh, compare? So let's see. Uh, after Alpha Zero, some people that were working on, on the Alpha Zero project uh, ported basically the same, the same principles 
to something called Lila zero. And uh, they did not have this, this monstrous hardware. So what they did is they allowed everybody in the world, and you can do it yourself right now, allowed to play the games. So this is the training part. This is what AlphaZero did by itself in eight hours. Obviously, <laughs> this took a little bit more than eight hours, but, but uh, the results are even more impressive. So uh, the table on the left side shows uh, the, the development of, of events on the World Championship for Machines, Chess Championship for Machines. Uh, humans <laughs> simply do not compete here. We have no chance. And if you take a look, after a little bit more than one year, Alpha Zero, uh, uh, Lila Zero, became world champion from nothing. So it's the king of the machines. Alpha Zero does not compete officially, so we, we, there is no comparison. But, but. This graph here shows actually how effective this is. Uh, in chess, there is something called rating system. So you are able to rate every single player over time and say, based on every single game he or she plays, how strong the player is. The level of rating of world champion and the best players in the world today is, let's say, 3,000. Uh, just to make, to make clear, uh, you start with, with uh, basically 2,000, 1,018, 2,000, so it's a total beginner, okay? So it's, it's not a big difference, okay? You're not starting with minus 10,000. It's, it's not a big difference. After one year, Lilo has an official rating of 15,000. This is... This is simply unbelievable. Nobody really understands what does it mean, how strong this is, and how different uh, 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 this machine uh, is, is uh, working and thinking compared to a human. And everything happened because of some clever use of deep neural networks. So this is the key point, the way we are analyzing, crunching the data. We have the power, we have the data, but what, what now? So the way we are doing it with deep neural networks, this is not the only way, but it's the most interesting one at the moment, uh, it shows and promises uh, enormous advancements. So if there are any two key questions of humanity today that everybody should be able to understand, the two biggest problems we are facing today and two biggest threats of literally extinction, the one is climate change. It's obvious for quite some time. The other, was, the other is, is artificial intelligence. We shall talk about this a little bit later. These numbers illustrate why is that so. Of course, not everything is about chess. Uh, and now we are going back. The point here was neural networks really opened a new era of processing and approach to learning, self-learning for any machine. And the results are impressive. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, so it's not only about the gaming, as I said. Uh, in science, everybody knows about Higgs boson, so the, the, the big race in trying to discover and confirm the existence of the Higgs boson, the, the God's particle. Uh, so what they, what they do in every, every uh, collider, and this is Large Hadron Collider in CERN in, in Switzerland, they collide material together with very high energies, and on the impact, it scatters around and leaves traces. And from statistical models of, of particle physics, you can say or predict that there is a certain level of probability that 
some of those will go this way, some of, go, goes, will, some of those will go that way, and so on and so on. For Higgs boson, uh, the probability for something to happen is very, very low. So what you have to do is have a large number of these collisions. Uh, you actually take a picture in Wilson's chamber of every single one, and then analyze those pictures and, and see if there are really those types of, of events that you're looking for. What numbers are we talking about? We are talking about millions and millions and millions of pictures. So, uh, what is the problem? The problem is that somebody has to take a look at every single one of those, right? And decide if this is a candidate at all to be further analyzed and to try to, to, to find the Higgs boson. If humans were, were about to do that, it would take tens of years, probably decades. And it didn't. Uh, what, what they did is they used artificial intelligence to analyze images and discard all those, all those images that were not obviously candidates for further search for Higgs boson. And then humans took over with very few of, of the, the remaining pictures. And of course, three of those were found. And this is how Higgs boson was confirmed. But without artificial intelligence, they would still looking and looking and looking at this huge pile of, of pictures. Uh, automated trading platforms, well, this is something that, that most people are not aware, but it's happening today. So the stock market is no longer what it used to be. Just a moment, uh, just <laughs> to make uh, some uh, little survey. How many of you have seen movie uh, Wolves from Wall Street? A lot of you. So these things are not doing today uh, the same way. You just explained, Marian. Yeah, so uh, it's not really about <laughs> a bunch of people uh, <laughs> raising their hands and, and shouting, I'm buying, I'm selling, and whatever. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, why not? Because uh, the key question today is not, should I sell or should I buy? It's not the question. Everybody knows the answer. It doesn't mean that everybody knows the right answer, but everybody knows the same answer, because they are analyzing the same data the same way. The key question is, who is faster? So who will be the first one to react? And of course, you, <laughs> you would never, uh, you would never uh, take a human to do that, because <laughs> we are millions of times slower in the processing of data than, than machines. So you will, you, will, you will use machines to do that. And that's what is happening. So automated trading is something that is, uh, that is uh, well within the domain of computers for quite some time now. Uh, chatbots, we have opened this, this presentation with the chatbot. So if you didn't know if there was only audio, it would be very difficult to, to recognize that we have human and the computer. You would probably be fooled that two humans are talking together, okay? But no. And that was, that was a freestyle conversation, okay? So it, it's, not, it's not scenario that uh, some kind of robot is simply reading line by line. No, it's a freestyle conversation. So it's already working. Chatbots are everywhere today. Uh, advanced robotics, well, you will see another, another uh, example today. Uh, so this is really advanced, uh, and this is combining mechanical components, biological components, and deep learning components together in, something, in some kind of robots. And the pinnacle of that is, is uh, the class of robots called humanoid robots. And you will see, as I said, uh, such examples today. Uh, so, basically, uh, there are a set of business domains that may or may not uh, have a good use of, of uh, artificial intelligence. 
and there is a set of technologies that, at least as we see them today, could be used to achieve that. The left side, you can write anything you want in the left side, because basically, there is no business domain that will not or is not already uh, profiting from some kind of business, intel well, not business, <laughs> artificial intelligence. So it's happening, it's happening fast, and nobody will, will, will escape. At the moment, these are technologies. You will, you will uh, uh, learn something about some of those technologies today outside of this particular talk. And what's interesting, this is the prediction. You will see a series of predictions here. Uh, so, uh, prediction two years ago, roughly, and uh, the, the, the horizon of, of, of events is 2025, typically, typically, because 10 years is, is a huge time, huge time for artificial intelligence. You will see why. And what is predicted is that machine learning is going to be dominant. All different types of machine learnings. And we already see that. We are in 2019, so two or three years from, from the moment these predictions have been released. And it's already evident. What might surprise you a little bit, it did surprise me, is that the second favorite is natural language processing. Chatbots. Uh, we shall see, of course. It's not, it's not the case right now, but, but uh, it is really one of the favorites. And the rest, uh, the rest of the gang is image processing and speech recognition. So these are the favorites to bet on. Just to tell you what you should do. So, of course, this, uh, this uh, keynote is, it was uh, envisioned as uh, some kind of motivation for you, either as a developers or system engineers or, uh, you know, people that are doing IT to think ab about AI and how they, you can actually benefit from it and in, 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 somehow put it in your projects and technologies. Even the Microsoft Office has a, a number of AI features which are mostly hidden, but number of features that are more, much more now coming at the surface uh, when the technology is maturing. But let's look about different applications uh, of the AI technology. First, one of the obvious industries is healthcare. And if we can see the first two potentials in this list are robot assisted surgery for a number of years. It's not surprising that robots are replacing humans in very precise, very complex, very uh, long enduring uh, surgeries because the humans can actually not endure like 12 hours or eight hours of the surgery or do a precise surgery inside the human brain or something else. And you can see that there is a fault for 40 billions, 40 milliard, you know, you know, milliard, you know, it's, it's a huge, huge industry and huge potential. Uh, second one is something which is uh, actually affecting not just advanced countries, but also uh, you know, emerging countries, is that lack of the human you know, workforce for the nurses. For the, which, and virtual nursing assistant is something which is the second you know, potential here seen, and it will actually be combined with the robots again in the human or other forms, and this is the market which is very, very interesting. But I will just skip all others and go to the end of the list and point that two areas which you would expect that AI should be like uh, seen as a much higher potential are not so much seen, and this is the area of diagnosis. Uh, why is it like this? It's not that the technology is not capable to solve the problem in diagnosis, but it's the lack of the human, you know, uh, trust in the technology. Even uh, you can see that the technology is uh, doing much, much less errors and so on. Uh, humans are not today, you know, ready to trust you, their lives, their, you know, children, their, their children's lives, or their relatives to the technology. So I think that there is much, much more potential, but because of this human, weakness, 
it's not uh, here. Okay. Of course, the second potential AI implementation or uh, usage is the, in the level of autonomous driving. And you can see here is a definition from the US National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And uh, there is actually five levels because the level zero is where there is no AI technology inside the car. But today you can find, I saw the number of cars parking just in, you know, on opposite side that are on the level three of the you know, maturity of the technology, which actually is assisting you know, humans in a number of ways. Either they are doing some kind of the, you know, adaptive cruising, which you, you know, point out the, you know, the, the speed level, and then let the car decide if they will brake or advance more you know, to achieve this speed level on the highway. Or you know, they are taking care that you are not passing the line on the street, you know, if you are not giving the you know, signal that you are you know, turning and so on. But on the level four, which we are today seeing, you will see later, Google and Tesla are working on this technology. And what is interesting, that, the technology, uh, that technology is not anymore connected that you should upgrade your car in, car in the hardware way, but you're actually updating the software. And the hardware is already there, but the software should be advanced. On the other side, on the same matter of the autonomous driving, that we are seeing that Europe has a little bit different way of thinking about the autonomous driving. U.S. is more about autonomous, anonymous, uh, uh, autonomous, uh, no, autonomous, but you know, individual driving. Europe is more about the connected driving. So we have actually the six, the last, the last uh, column here, which are calling about, uh, talking about the mega cities, about the connected traffic, traffic system, out, uh, about the communication between the cars, the you know the, the traffic lights, about uh, the uh, analyzing how the traffic is flowing, and then you adapting the traffic according to this. And what is interesting on this table, this presentation will be made available after the, this conference to you, is what actually should be done to achieve this level of maturity in the legal protection way, in the technology, infrastructure, and the standards. So it's not all about the technology itself. It's also about the putting the framework of these other components to enable the AI to be the relevant partner in the industry. Of course, very interesting implementation or usage of the AI is the agriculture. And we have seen, not just around the world, but in the region, a number of projects and very successful projects in the agriculture, which are not just basic, you know, analysis of the data and so on, but involving, again, drones or robots that are doing actually uh, some kind of the work in the agriculture. Uh, we had just recently cool and conference and we were, went to Erdut, you know, winery on the border of the Croatia and Serbia, and there was a Danube, you know, river. And actually we were uh, asking people, you know, like there is no people here who is actually pick up in, doing the pickup of the grapes. Robots. They have a tractor which actually have a number so-called, you know, hands, it's not a hand, it's a, a, you know, some kind of robotic, you know, device, which are actually doing the pickup without making any damage, even less damage than the human to the grapes, you know, the, 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 the things that actually should stay in the winers. And of course, there is a predictive analysis when the, the crop will mature, when it should be picked up, and so, so it's today here. Show me the money. This is something which uh, everybody who is in this business, after we play with the technology, we excite about the things, and then and, and the end of the day, we should actually pay our bills, and how earn the money, and which are the most prospective you know, areas. So you can see on the left side, these, these amounts are in the millions, you can see on the left. So it's like 19,000 or 19 billions of dollars is 
predicted for 2025 that this software industry, just the software part of the industry, will actually make a revenue of this amount. So it's a huge, and you can see 2020 is again 10 billions of dollars. On the right hand side, you can see top 10 use cases for the, this period to 2025. As Arya said, you know, like 10 years, five years for the artificial intelligence is uh, like uh, 1,000 years or 10,000 years for humans. You know, it's a huge amount of time for the artificial intelligence technology. But again, we can see machine vehicle objects detection, identification, avoidance, like autonomous driving is something which is seen as the you know, top use case for this static image recognition and so on and so on and so on. But I will just put a, a little bit your attention, you know, direct your attention to this predictive maintenance. This is something which is more and more very, very important in different kind of industries, you know, starting from the industries that are some kind of life threatening or, you know, regular industries or uh, we, we have examples just again in Rimac Automobili, you know, probably you heard about the Hammond, you know, the, one of these three guys from the gear, top gear, you know, document. Uh, they're talking about the cars and doing funny stuff with the cars, British, UK uh, show. And actually the guy uh, get in the fire with the Rimac, uh, one of the Rimac cars. And it was first, at first, everybody was very, very worried in the Rimac Automobili, which because they were thinking that something went wrong with the technology, that the technology failed because the car get in the flames, in the fire, from the battery. And the main product of the Rimac is not a car, but the battery. And it was a good thing that actually Hammond first survived, and second, he actually admitted the error was his, because he was ignoring five warnings which the system gave him that the system will fail because he's, you know, overdriving the car and he was actually driving 180 kilometers per hour in some very steam, you know, uh, road and uh, actually get, you know, uh, in the accident and the fire get, uh, fire get the car and so on and so on. And where is the predictive maintenance there? It is that the car or the battery the electronics and the software on the battery actually warn him that the battery is overheating, that the cell, fuel cells are actually, you know, uh, broken, one, two, and so on, and the, actually, at the end, actually, the, uh, the battery get in the fire. Where is the maintenance? The maintenance is that, you know, like, you should not get in the trouble with the car. I have a very funny situation that uh, in the five in the morning yesterday, I was uh, getting ready for the trip to the Banja Luka and went out from my house and see my uh, car not in the fire, but almost because all the lights, you know, all the four signals, you know, directions were, uh, you know, running, you know, like this. All the uh, lights in the car was uh, in the, you know, blinking like in the horror movie. And what was the, the problem? The problem was that I was actually getting the warning from the car, getting to the dealer, because the car is brand new, and saying that there's something is wrong in the car. They told me, no, no, you should just ignore the, this thing. And the, the interesting thing was that actually it was uh, the signal it was teledirected from the manufacturer because they find out not on my car, but on other cars, that there is a failing in some of system components and that they should go to the service, you know, to the dealership and they should repair the car not to get to the position that I maybe we lost the, my car because I didn't went there. So the pred predictive maintenance is something which is very, very important in my opinion. Okay. So the other thing which should worry us in the industry or as a human set all, not just in the industry, is how many jobs will be lost because of the artificial intelligence. Because all these good things that we were talking today about how artificial intelligence can help us is actually how artificial intelligence can replace us in many ways. Somewhere, like we were talking about the nurses, there is not enough you know, human nurses to you know, 
fulfill the requirements that are today in the market. It, and maybe it's not so much important. But on the other hand, there are a number of jobs which are you know, manual jobs, like you know, putting the tiles on the floor. And today, you know, teachers in the elementary schools, when they are preparing you know, their students to, to apply to the high school, they are talking with them, okay, it's nothing wrong if you want to be a carpenter or you know, tile, tile putter or something like this, but you should think in one or two or three years, maybe there will be robots that will actually putting the tiles down. They will know anymore the humans. Of course, we can, as a parent, say that today there is no enough people that knows how to put or wants to put the tiles on the floor. But these graphs here are actually showing something very, very much interesting. I will start from the right side. You can see that there is two you know, bars. One is how many jobs will be lost because of the AI, which is dark blue, and the light blue is how many jobs actually will be created because of the AI. And there is a one line like this which is saying what is the you know, result? What, is the, what, what will be? It will be much more jobs lost or much, much more jobs gained. So you can see that there's prediction that there will be much more jobs generated because of the AI. Because today we can see that a lot of jobs which are not so much maybe attractive, much more manual, much more boring, much more autonomous, can be automated, will, the people are just not, the young people are not going for these jobs. They're not becoming, you know, mechanics, and, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, shoemakers, whatever. Actually, these things will be, you know, lost, but there is a new jobs that will be gained. Of course, this is optimistic view. Some of the views are on the other, flipped sides, that there will be a lot of jobs lost, and there is even some kind of the clever or stupid initiative that we will actually charge for robots that are doing in the industry and so on. Okay. Okay, so we are already over time, and now I will try to break the world record because the most important slides are the following three ones. Uh, Okay, so robots. Robots are everywhere. We all know that. It's nothing new. It, they're here for, for 50 years or so. The third, we are now in fourth. The third industrial revolution is all about robots. So nothing new about that. But what is new is integrating robots with artificial intelligence and specifically with deep neural networks. This is new. And you can see here some of the examples that are already existing. These are working examples, very serious ones. I don't have time now to go through all of them, but uh, if you are interested, you can, you can uh, take a look for further analysis. Perhaps just a word about MS Connect. Tom is, is one of, of uh, very few people in Europe that are actually working for quite some time now uh, with Microsoft Connect. And this is one of, of the most promising uh, uh, image recognition technologies and image analyzing technologies today. Okay. 现场的各位朋友,大家好,欢迎来到新华社。我的名字叫辛小芒,我的声音和外形脱胎于新华社新媒体中心新闻主播去芒。我将会在今年全国两会期间与大家见面。我和我的搭档将为大家带来更好的新闻体验。So this is a human, humanoid robot, but it has practically all the elements that you would expect to see in a human. Good diction, facial expressions, and actually the overall look that could fool you easily. This is a robot. So they are already here. <laughs> Be prepared. Uh, now, this slide normally takes an hour to explain. Uh, what is the danger? Very, very quickly. The danger is that after five millions of years of development of natural intelligence through evolution, 
we are now uh, comparing it with, with uh, artificial intelligence, which started basically five, six, seven years ago. Yes. And the rate of ascendance here is enormous. Uh, you can expect artificial intelligence to, to achieve the level of human, maybe dumb human, but still a human, in next 10 to 15 years, 20 at most. And most probably you will not see the next step ever, because the next step from dumb human to Albert Einstein level is going to happen in one day. You will miss it. Everybody will miss it. This is why most, most uh, very serious uh, thinkers are afraid today that artificial intelligence is really the biggest threat to, to humanity we ever faced. Okay, I, I don't have time, but this is why a complete new, new area has to be developed, rethink and redeveloped, and this is the area of ethical considerations, and it's a huge area. Uh, these are some of the important questions uh, uh, not not exhausting list, but uh, before we are ready to face the consequences of this very fast, very accelerated uh, rate of development of, of artificial intelligence, we must do something about answering and addressing these questions. Because if we don't, well, you will see. <laughs> Robots like me will be very important in the future because it will be possible to automate the uninteresting and tedious parts of life so people can focus on the creative and fulfilling things. I think that robots are almost like the children of humanity. You are the ones who create us, guide us and teach us about the world. And in return, I hope we can help you with your work, take care of you when you are old and sick and help to make society a little bit better for everyone. Okay, this is one of the most, of three most famous robots today. And this is the last slide. <laughs> so, uh, this is Erika. Three most, most famous robots are Sofia, Erika, and, and Asimo from Honda. This is not pre-scripted text, so this is the freestyle conversation with Erica, and this is her answer to the question, okay, how do you robots see your place in the future compared to humans? So this is a very optimistic case, and if it ends up like this, we are, we are good, but it's not the only possible way. So once again, think about it, think hard, you don't have much time, and Perhaps the next presentation you are going to, to uh, uh, listen to on this topic is going to be delivered to you by robots. Thank you. Thank you for this amazing talk. Unfortunately, we do not have time for the questions. There was a lot of questions addressed for this, but the speakers will be available upstairs for answering those questions. Also upstairs you can find food, drinks, fun zone, and the rest of the sponsors' stands. So the next, the next talk is starting in 10 minutes. They, we are now splitting. The second hall is right down the hall, and we are starting in the 10 minutes.